Okay, today is October 26th, 2020, and we're here to talk about Mycroft. That's what we talk about every day. Huh. So uh, we have uh, one more week left in our pseudo sprint here. Um, or we actually, we were going to talk about whether or not we were going to close out this last sprint and start a new one. Uh, that gives us two weeks until our retreat. Um, which is definitely going to be a two-week sprint of its own, or maybe two one-week sprints. We'll see how that goes. But um, uh, does anybody have any feedback about um, the current sprint and the current activities that you're on? Uh, are we are we pretty much wrapped up with them, uh, or are we still in the middle of of the sprint 17? Uh, Chris Vera, let's start with you since you've got the longest-term project right now. Yeah. So the tagger is in test right now. Um, and it's ready to be banged on. There's still some things. Um, uh, the, the code that's running in test right now, so it needs to be code reviewed before I can actually cut a release, but it's out there for playing. Um, so really, I'm at a point now where, you know, what do we want me doing next? Do we want me to pick some more? You know, do you want to pick up the, what we think is the most important thing to improve upon with the tagger that's missing with it right now? Or do I want to move on to um, something that's the prototypes? So, um, and of course, I'll do whatever bug fixes anybody finds as they test the tagger, but um, that's kind of where What's I What's the uh, plan for getting this rolled out? In other words, how do we actually get devices uploading to the new URL? And is the new URL production operational? Um, so first I need to get this, um, so first we need to test it. Once we're tested and we're happy with it, how it's working in test, I need to cut a release, deploy it to production. And then once it's there, um, we can start pointing, um, core to using it. Right now there's plenty of files out there to be tagged. Um, so. But yeah, that's that's certainly a, a next step after we deploy this is making sure the core hits the new endpoint as far as uploading the file to the new um, place. Yeah, I'd like to get that. Uh, I'd like to get to that point for sure. You know, because then it's really in production. We're actually using it, and I can start using my kids and you know all the uh, the people in and out of my house uh, to who are largely uh, women to you know, start uploading new wake words and that sort of thing. So yeah, I can, that can be the next thing I do then. I can um, start working on core, on the, the changes to core needed to hit this new endpoint. Okay. So I think that's, that'll be the next priority is in a, getting this integrated. So uh, test, I want everybody banging on this thing, um, you know, uh, this week. It won't take a lot of time, but let's get some, get uh, Chris some feedback for all his hard work he's put in here. And um, let's get that uh, pull request reviewed and approved and deployed to production. And um, yeah, let's get this, let's get the system fully online before we move on to the next thing. Um, okay. So that'll be, um, that'll there's, be also, there's also a couple of side issues like, um, well, unrelated stuff that uh, if you if you have any spare time, you could you could jump back to like we've got to upgrade Mattermost and yeah. some PRs to review and that sort of stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's where I am. So I mean, I like we I could spend a, a one week sprint cleaning up and getting this deployed to production. And some other things, and then we could have a one-week sprint to plan for our, our summit. Or um, I could spend a week doing this and come up with something else to do <laughs> once this is done. But yeah. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's prioritize getting this deployed to production, and uh, uh, let's have a talk uh, um, before you run out of things to do. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, your next priorities, because I've got a list of priorities that are just not in front of me at the moment. Um, That's fine. I mean, we, we speak three times a week, so I'm sure I won't, I won't, I won't be uh, twiddling my thumbs for too long. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, you've got all the, yeah, like, as Gus mentioned, you've got to upgrade and those sorts yeah. of things. So, yeah. Funny to do. Yeah. OK, great. Uh, so, Gez, um, what do you think? Um, as, as far as the sprint goes, or how are you? Uh, um, where are you sitting? Yeah, so the I think as I've said way too many times, Lingua Franca has been has been progressing well, uh, but it's getting closer every time. Um, so we've done the the old release and um, just had a few changes to to put in before doing the point three release. Um, the the bugs in the skills that are in progress at the moment. Um, I haven't haven't seen them in quite some time, and I fixed some other issues related to you know tests bleeding into each other. So I'm kind of thinking I might just bump those for a minute until they resurface, if they resurface, because that might have they might have actually been addressed by these other bug fixes. Um, there's the uh, CI stuff around handling simultaneous point conf runs, um, which is a bit of an unknown. Uh, I think I have an idea of what is needed there, but so it could be a five minute job or it could be a day job. Um, and then there's a couple of uh, lower priority things hold that have been held over since the 2008 release <clears throat> around uh, updating Mimic in, in core and generating new uh, Mark 1 image, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so there's, you know, things that if they didn't happen right now wouldn't be the end of the world, but I think it's good to clear them off the plate. Uh, so yeah, can easily spend another week on this. In short. Okay. Um, I saw some chatter going back and forth about some uh, the Microsoft Skill Marketplace and um, and other you know potential marketplaces and that sort of thing. Um, I, I took yeah. a look at that, and my thought was that um, I understand Jarvis's you know objection, like, hey, will you support this you know awful feature, why not support this other awful feature? Um, and uh, and my answer to that is, hey, we totally should not support that awful feature. So um, I, think, <laughs> I think that we should uh, discuss removing the ability to install arbitrary stuff uh, from the Microsoft skill marketplace. And you know, if we want to have a utility that lets you install arbitrary code off a of GitHub, then that's fine. But we'll just call it you know, unsupported library installer or something like that. <laughs> You know, uh, but it's it's definitely not part of our marketplace. You know, it's it's sort of a misnomer to say that, um, you know, you can just install any piece of code and it's you know it's part of our marketplace because it's not right. The marketplace is about putting out good quality stuff that we have at least some modicum of you know oversight over. Um, and um, yeah. you know, like I said, I'm totally you know I get it. It should be an open system. We want to be open, and I'm totally fine with there being more than one store. Uh, but we need to be very clear about the provenance of the software that people are installing. And if people are installing it from some third-party service, no matter what that service is, um, you know, uh, we have no responsibility for that. You know, and and we need to make that clear. So that's why I'm advocating for uh, removing um, the ability to just install arbitrary stuff on, off of GitHub uh, through the skill marketplace command line. Um, just that's just, that's my thought. I, I don't know if that's the right solution, but I think that's that's the thought process, you know, behind it. Um, you know, maybe the, the right well, solution is something, something else that needs to be addressed head on, right? I mean, I can tell you as a developer of iPhone and Android games that when my first game, Panda Poo, was rejected by the iPhone store, my response was, "Why would you do such a thing when I'm able to discover fart apps?" And their response was, yes, and we have enough of those too. So the question becomes, how do we encourage people to contribute while maintaining control over some subset of all the skills that are out there? And 
maybe it is the case that we have to have two separate stores, a Mycroft blessed endpoint and the Wild West endpoint. But certainly we don't want to discourage our contributors from contributing FART applications to the Mycroft store. Agreed. We should have lots of FART applications well, in the store. There, there is a FART so, skill. So, so you... yeah. So I, so Michael and I have been having some conversations about this relative to our monetization strategy. The Mycroft as a company and Mycroft as a project cannot continue to exist at the largest of investors. Um, you know, I heard Amazon's early days described as Amazon is a charity that just run in the for the benefit of its customers at the expense of its investors. Right. And that's from a Wall Street analyst that thought Amazon was a dog in the late 90s. So that guy is probably uh, uh, probably regretting it at this point. But the, the point being, um, you know, we need to have a strategy where we get paid. And so the mechanism that we're considering, and I think we mentioned this last week, too, is a mechanism whereby um, for. Give me a second to gather my thoughts here. Um, a mechanism whereby we develop a paid tier and all of our existing customers are installed into the paid tier uh, for some period of time, you know, 90 days or 180 days free of charge. And then the media, all of our existing customers to paid customers. As part of the paid tier, you're able to install and deploy apps through Selini. So if you're looking for something to do, there's a job for you, Chris Fair, um, through Selini or through the, the voice interface that are approved and are part of the Mycroft skills, the official Mycroft skills abstraction. The skills that are part of that process are, um, you know, the developers will receive 25% of the gross revenue from the Mycroft paid tier divided according to the utility of the skill. And, you know, the devil's in the details. How, what is the utility of the skill, right? Um, is it the number of times people query it? Because, you know, my kid can do a thousand spark skill you know, and make sure that it's at the top of the tier. One individual. But, but uh, you know, we divide up the 25% of the revenue that's flowing into the, into the paid skills abstraction uh, according to the utility of the skills. And it could be that it's solving your... can is as simple as, you know, if a skill's been deployed for a certain period of time and hasn't a scored, you know, then it gets booted out of our and into our free tier, right? The free tier, I think, is a free-for-all, right? People can do whatever the hell they want, we're responsible for the encryption, and we're not responsible for this. But because all of our users are in the pain tier on day one, if one is bigger scale, it makes more sense to push it into the pay paid customers than we have free customers and as an added benefit when people use it you get paid right um, I think that that solves a couple of the problems but I think that the broader the, the broader uh, thinking on that method of solving the problem is that we want to create economic incentives Josh, you're about two steps too far for your microphone. I'm on my phone. It's, it's been cutting out. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, the, uh, sorry, let me get back. The mics are right here. Um, let me back that up. The, the broader thinking there is that we want to develop, as part of our paid tier, a series of economic incentives for the developers and the community members to behave in the way that we want them to behave, not the types of thumbs up, thumbs down, arbitrary rule making that they use in the, in the Apple App Store. Yeah. And so, you know, I think we always want to make it possible if Joe wants to install a fart skill on his Mycroft device for him to do that. But we want to set up a system whereby for a vast majority of our community, um, that fart skill is, you know, not part of their everyday existence. And so, um, 
you know, I think that the, the way I just described it is a good first brush at that. Um, but I think we need to write it up, circulate it through the community. And then, you know, I, I, I was a bit stunned, Gez, about your post where you asked the community for feedback into our roadmap and you got crickets. Like nothing, not a single comment on that. And so I don't know if that's because people are unengaged or because they just trust us. But let's go ahead and circulate some kind of an economic model and go from there. And that way, if somebody creates a terrible skill that goes in the free tier, the free tier ideally has far fewer users than the paid tier, and it can just go out there and clutter up the free skill score all we want. But if people want a skill store that works well, where the skills are guaranteed to not, you know, root your device and, and you know, send all your personal information to the internet, um, they would want to be on our paid tier. And the ways of getting that are number one, pay us. Number two, buy a device from us. And then, you know, for people who are interested in contributing in a significant way, if they want to take the money that they're making from creating an awesome skill that people are using and getting their 25 cents on the dollar from our, our paid tier and use it to pay for their membership, good on them, right? So if you can make three bucks a month on people using your skill, then your skill should be self-supporting, right? Um, it pays there's for your membership. There's never be a skill that would brick your device on the marketplace. I just got to say that. I mean, there's there's got to be some modicum oh, of, you know, sure it's on the free tier, but if some, you know, this is going out to 5,000 people and somebody goes to the free tier and clicks on a skill and bricks their device, that's bad. Yeah, I think, I think, well, we, they, owe it. I think we owe it to the community that any endpoints that we support that are on our domain, we can't speak to skills in the wild, but if they come from a Mycroft source, we need to do at least our minimal due diligence to make sure it's not a skill that simply fires up, takes your key store, sends it to the cloud, and provides no capabilities or functionality. So, um, and even if it did, we would want to question why it needs to send the key store to the cloud. So I think it's incumbent upon us to review every skill that we're going to host. However, I don't know that that means every skill we host finds its way into some sort of premier category location. And I think we're all clear on that, but I just wanna call out that I don't think in any way we should ever allow a skill on a Mycroft hosted site that hasn't been vetted minimally. But, well, I, yeah. I, I, go ahead. I, I, yeah, I mean, if they want to, if we want to do community vetting for that stuff, it's great. But you're looking at the entire team, right? And we don't have time to review. We don't have time to review. There's already thousands of skills out there. We can't review all the code for all those skills without being paid. And so, on the free tier of the service, if somebody wants to deploy a skill that roots the device and you know sends out passwords, and somebody else installs that skill, right, and runs it. You know, I got a, my computer's packed with, with malware, right? Like I have whole folders of it. I have trouble, I have trouble, I have trouble syncing my stuff to Google because I have whole folders full of malware that's intended for, you know, security research and penetration testing. If I want to run that stuff and send my creds to China, I, I can't. I, I think, right? I can't, you can't protect users from themselves. I, I think, well, I, I think I, you're both my right. Wife, yeah, my wife would love to speak with you because she has the same problem, but that's not my point. My point is, I think if it's a Mycroft hosted endpoint, we need to do our due diligence. And if we have thousands of them out there and we haven't vetted them, then we need to remove them and vet them. I, I, don't, I don't really think we should be putting unvetted things on our site. Uh, it just doesn't seem like but good business. We, but that's we, don't have, we don't have anything unvetted in, in the marketplace, just to be clear. Like, Judge is just talking about things out there in, in the wild. In, to my mind, the, the two sides, I don't know if we, how much we want to have this whole conversation at the moment or if you were about to suggest we move on. Uh, so maybe before I make a comment, I'll let you. Go ahead, uh, finish your comment, and then, yeah, I think we can okay. move on after this. I just, I, I, see, the, I see the two, I, I think we, we do need to have a minimum level of responsibility um, because I think even if it is the end users, you know, uh, their role and and they went and they went and installed something without reviewing the code 
like the vast majority of our users are not actually Python coders, you know, they're, they're just people that want to click a button and have a thing run and they will do that. And then if something bad happens, they'll blame Mycroft and Mycroft will be, you know, they'll be in the news about, you know, this so-called secure and private voice assistant is, is completely the opposite. You know, it's sending, it's sending data off to Russia, whatever. Um, so I do think I, I do think we have a minimum responsibility for things that are that we provide a simple mechanism to do. Like I, I don't think it's a bad thing that people can um, go through some kind of manual process to install things from from places like GitHub. But I think we needed to make it we need to make it difficult enough that you can't just click a button to do it. So so personally, I see that the two tiers being you know, anything that's listed in the marketplace has at least been security reviewed. Anything that is verified as, you know, good and working and has the Microsoft tick of approval, has the, you know, the, the premium tick of approval. Um, we've, we've verified that it, that the functionality works as intended, um, that, you know, it, it handles error messages gracefully, like, you know, it meets a, a particular UX standard. So the, the minimum standard being security and then the premium standard being UX and, and usability and stuff. And the, the second tier is very clearly behind a paywall, right? Because right. we cannot afford to do that for free no, because absolutely. we do not charge, we do not spy on our customers, right? The way, and to, in order to fund that, the way that, 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 well, let's just be honest. I mean, this is published, but whatever, the way that Google does, right? And, uh, and then I would argue that Amazon's is already behind a paywall because you basically have to have Amazon Prime in order for Echo not to suck. So they have some huge percentage of their, their I mean, you are paying a monthly fee with Amazon. It's like 14 bucks a month, right? So, you know, that stuff has to be behind a paywall because we have to make payroll. So the only thing that we're really having a discussion about is what does the free tier look like? Well, That's and it. I think and for how, the, and how do we for, manage it? For payments and stuff, I, I think it, it makes sense for us to look at you know, we're doing some some user interviews at the moment. Um, Chris, Johnny, and I are doing some user interviews to to look at what is the value that people get out of Mycroft or want to get out of Mycroft, and and then trying to align trying to align our our payment structure, uh, our fee structure, in line with with the value that people get. So I, I think there's a whole lot of work we can do around there to 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 understand that better and to align them better. You know. I agreed. And I'll just, you know, uh, just because I want to get the final word in here, I think we need to distinguish between um, what it is that we put the Mycroft brand on and what it is that we allow people to do with their hardware. And I think that uh, Ken is absolutely right. You know, anything that we put our brand on, uh, anything that we endorse in any way that comes from us, from one of our URLs, needs to be something that we can stand behind. Uh, on the other hand, you know, our, our ideals of being an open platform, of being an open source company, um, I think, you know, uh, really support the idea of, well, we don't have to be the gatekeepers of all software, right? Um, but just because, um, uh, but that doesn't mean, you know, we have to allow people to do whatever they want on our system, right? Our system is the marketplace. The, that is our name. That is our reputation. That is what we have. That's what's valuable to us, right? So, um, so if people want to install a, um, you know, a third-party store, um, you know, I, I think that's fine. But then somebody else is standing behind that store, not us. Um, and uh, you know, and we can talk, uh, at, you know, some more about, you know, the system architecture behind. Well, okay, well, how do we support multiple stores? What happens during updates and things like that, you know? Um, but um, uh, but yeah, so that's that's how I see it. But uh, we'll we'll hash this out in more detail, um, and make sure that we can you know service both of those ideals of protecting our brand and um, and being a an open company. Okay, so uh, moving on. Um, oh, Ken, hey, um, I heard that uh, you were working on a cool project. How's it going? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Thanks for remembering me. Uh, so <laughs> okay, here's how it's going. 
So I've got two pull requests out there. Um, one is against core. I did some significant refactoring of the last version of the code. So I have two pull requests out there. One is for the skill, which is just the init file and some cleanup there and refactoring. The second is for core, and it is in the enclosure directory where this stuff belongs. Um, now, that being said, my question would be, A, how do we coordinate a release between two different repositories like this? Because the Kivi image, if it goes out with one but not both, will not work. Uh, so how do we coordinate that? And then the second thing is the... Um, the code that I've, uh, the two pull requests I put together uh, are not the complete story because I'm not sh quite sure where to stick the executable. We now have taken on the responsibility of releasing an executable called VF control underscore USB, which is how we communicate with our hardware. So the question I have is, A, is this the first time we ran across such an issue where we actually have an external executable that is part of our product? And if it's not the case, where do we stick them? And if it is the case, where should I stick it? Um, also, uh, it would be nice if we could include the bug fix that I put together for the core Kivi display code line regarding the bus timing bring up issue in conjunction with these two pull requests, which is the new enclosure code and the um, init code that makes use of them. Uh, now, that being said, um, what was interesting is that when I submitted my pull request, created it, about 15 minutes later, I got a email with a bunch of PEP issues in it regarding a bunch of Lint-like stuff, um, which is insignificant. I mean, there's about 30 of them, and I haven't gone through them yet. There's, oh, there's a trailing white space. Oh, there's two empty lines instead of one. One of them was even, oh, there's an empty line at the end of the file. So I'll fix those. Uh, my question is, why didn't I see that the last time I did my pull request since I tend to code the same way and the same issues should have been present? And if it's because we've instituted something between then and now, my question is, what happens if somebody in the future tries to fix a bug? Are they now going to get a lint error message that says this thousand line piece of code has all of these lint issues and your one line bug fix will no longer be accepted until you fix the entire file? Or, or what's going on here is my question. So two questions. Number one, where do I stick executables? And number two, why am I getting a bunch of pep lint error messages when I never did before? I want the, the, the linting thing to be part of something we discuss during our summit. Um, because I want to come out of the summit with a, this is how what we're going to start enforcing um, from a pull request, request point of view, whether it be, you know, black or pilot or however we do it and how that's done. Um, so I would like to table that until um, <laughs> too much so discussion. The pull requests I created, they, they'll go through without this issue being resolved. Well, I, I assume that what's happened with, with this pull request as opposed to the previous one is that the past one, you just added a line or something, right? Whereas this one, you've added new files. And so I think the way, no, you know. No, 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 the right? new files are okay. both. Yeah. No, this is definitely different behavior than it was two weeks ago. Wasn't so, the, was, didn't you have problems with uh, Travis for a little bit there, Chris? Uh, this doesn't seem to be, this just seems to be expected behavior. Okay. Is it expected behavior? Is that correct? So the email is actually from Pep, right? Pep eight speaks. Yeah. How come I've never yeah. seen this before? I well, it was the other PR on Microsoft Core, or was it on a on a you know which PR are you talking about? There were two: one on Microsoft Core and one on Skill. Microsoft. No, uh, the Skill repository probably, probably doesn't have the same check. Yeah. We need yeah. to be consistent yeah. about how we check code on all of our. doesn't have the same check. Yeah, so that's that's the other part, which which I think we'll also which talk about. Which still doesn't make stuff. any sense because Once the last the last mm -hmm. pull requests had both code in core and code in skill, and I didn't get. Oh, it. I can go have a look at your other PR, your old PR, and I'll I'll 
message. All right, so, right so the point is I, we can submit this pull request without the PEP lint issues being addressed and nothing will preclude it from working, correct? Nothing will preclude it from working, but I would prefer that we address the linting issues. That That's we, fine. I'm, wrote, an, yeah. I'm becoming more used to these sorts of things moving forward. I, I, I do believe it's a bit of fascist behavior, but I'd be, be getting conditioned to that this year. So that's not a problem. <laughs> um, okay, so and one of the things we want to do is, is decide on a standard and then give you know, internal developers and community developers the, the, um, you know, the rules and the way that they can set their IDE up, set their environment up, set their workflow up so that they always abide by that, you know, that it's yeah, not a cumbersome There's process. pre commit hooks you can do too. Like right now I've got pre commit hooks that will run these linters on my code before I even commit it so that the chances of it failing in the uh, PR process are minimal. But again, this is all stuff I want to, I want to go over um, when we're all talking together and kind of come up with something that Chris can present to the community. Um, I, I get that, and, but my point is you guys are looking at this from a different perspective than I am. You're looking at it like how to impose your will on the community, and I'm looking at it like, is this going to be an issue if somebody fixes a bug in a big file, and is it going to discourage them, and they're going to say, I'm not going to fix all of that crap just to fix this one line, or will it not kick in in that case? Yeah, and that's part of the discussion. Okay, so I'll take that as a yes. All right, so anyway, the, again, the last hanging chat, as we like to say in Florida, is what do you want me to do with this executable? I, I can't answer I, that myself because I, I have never have no idea what that is. <laughs> we, don't have, we, don't have any, we don't have any proprietary, well, I can't think of any proprietary executables that we run at all. Is that correct? We don't have any like exe files that we run, well, not exes obviously in Linux, but any executables that we run that we don't build from source? Is that a true statement? No third party libraries, nothing like that? Hmm. I mean, it seems like it's something that would be part of the enclosure then. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's nothing fancy inside of it. I think it's a utility for convenience of developers with the XMOS chip. Um, it all it does is send. Uh, no, it's with USB. what we rely on. It's what we rely on to change the volume, to set sure. the leads. To, right. Well, so we need it. Yeah. We do need yeah. it, but I think we could replace it with uh, with our own library of routines that just send commands over the USB to the XMOS chip. Right. Uh, yeah. In other words, you're saying we could rewrite VF Control USB. Yeah, I don't. Th I think it's. I don't think there's much to it. I think it's a pretty lightweight application. Um, it's not. It's not certainly not a driver or anything like that. I think. I, I think it's pretty lightweight. I don't think it's something we should do immediately. I think we should stick the executable in there and then look into what's required into you know to make it just a library that we can call inside Python. Um, oh. All right, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to include it in the core uh, pull request. I'm going to stick it in enclosure. And I'm going to point all hard-coded paths to in enclosure. Um, uh, ah, it's exception to my solution. That's good. Well, That's my my well, only my concern there is, are we shoving an executable in to be on every installation, regardless of whether it's got this enclosure or not? Um, it just feels like something that should be part of the enclosure recipe build process. Build process. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Um, How do I get these files there? So That's the kind of input I'm repo, Well, the, so there's, <laughs> I'm, we've, we've been trying to get all of our uh, build recipes. Well, I mean, it depends on, on what solution we go up, in, go with in the end. Like if we go with Why Pandhub, we're getting a little like, close to release to not being able to answer this fundamental question. <laughs> well, my, my answer, my answer would be that personally would be, we have a repo called Microsoft dash devices, and we've been using a system called um, DevOps, which, which builds images. And so we've been building up these recipes to automatically build images, but um, currently that, you know, that's, that's used for, like, that's how I build the QT images. Um, we, the KV images are, are 
a slightly manual build with um, using the Pycroft instructions. There's a Pycroft recipe, you know, that's that's in progress, but it's you know, it's not a priority at all, so it hasn't hasn't been finished off. Other repos that do exactly the same thing, um, <laughs> or that have instructions on how to do exactly the same thing a different way. So, so well, this, okay, but obviously we haven't corrected it yet because my build still has Mark One artifacts on it. How does that happen? Because that's in Minecraft Core. Uh huh. And then we want to pull those out. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's wrong. Ken, you are you are correct. That is wrong. It should not be that way. It is intended to be fixed. And that's fine, but my question is still remains, annoying as it may be, and you'll probably notice I changed my icon to Columbo. Uh, so the point is, where would you like me to place these files so they will be included in the next Kivi build image? For Kivi, then I would say the, the uh, I can't remember the name, of, what's the name of the repo, Chris? Uh, Microsoft Display slash Mycroft display. So Mycroft display is where I would stick the new remote branch called SJ201 Rev B. Uh, well, that Mycroft display repo was really just the key. Uh -huh. And then is it also where I would stick the changes to the skill Mark 2 dash pi? Does it have a clone of that repository as well? Or are you simply saying that's where you'd like this executable file to find its way? I think the executable file should find its way right now. The way things are right now, I, I say it should go in the Mark II um, recipe repository, which I think is just called Enclosure Mark II. Wonderful. Okay. If somebody can email me a link to that, I will get VF Control USB pull requested into there. Where would you like the Mark II SJ201 hardware drivers and abstract based classes so that they find their way into the next Kivi build? That's a harder question because I think that all the Kivi stuff is often a separate branch that has not been merged. I contend if we're planning on pushing this product out to customers within 30 days, we need to be answering these questions now. Do we need to have a separate meeting offline after this one to button this down? Or what I are we, thought we were going to talk about this during our retreat? What's that? I thought we, we were going to talk about this during the summit. We definitely need to talk about reorganizing, or at least maybe organizing for the very first time, skills versus core versus enclosures and what all that means. Because apparently it's just a hot mess. But I agree with Ken. We need to have an answer for what to do right now. He needs to if this so i think the answer is it doesn't matter ken because we don't have a system so put it yeah, so if it's if it's in tv if we're only doing tv then we can point devices out <laughs> if if we know which 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 version of the mark ii that we're talking about then we can point you to all the right repos we just you know this is this is part of the problem when we when we have qt and kiwi and and all these things flying around and and then pantahub you know all this new system and and not knowing you know obviously that's going to include either qt or kiwi but like but then it's going to have its own build process as well and we don't know what that looks like yet um like with all these pieces up in the air i can't just tell you live on the chat where where it should go without knowing which which version it needs to go in so i contend this is important enough that we should have a meeting tomorrow and resolve it i thought i heard derek alluding to actually sending out devices with images later this week i don't understand how we can leave this hanging beyond that point i thought well, we said those weren't going out then at the end of this week yeah we're not going to send those out the end of this week for part of this this is part of the reason um but um, but I agree. I mean, I don't think we should wait till tomorrow. I think after this call, you guys should get on the line and hash something out. Um, but I contend that I, I still think that the answer is it doesn't matter. Just put it somewhere that it works. Because and it doesn't seem to matter right everything, now. We can fix that too. Okay, so I'll, I'll, here's what I'm going to say. Uh, then here's the, the quick and dirty solution. 
Somebody's going to email me the link where the actual executable should go. Somebody said it was device something or other. Wonderful. I'll, I'll put a pull request there. There are two outstanding pull requests, one against core and one against Kibi or uh, feature slash Kibi dash display. Those pull requests should be reviewed and, and give me any feedback, okay? The assumption is once that's done, I'm out of the loop and somebody's going to make sure that everything magically happens the way it's supposed to downstream. If they can't do that, they can ask me for help, but that's, that's what I'm going to do moving forward. I'll have that done by noon tomorrow. You want to meet and discuss these issues? We could do it tonight. We could do it tomorrow. I'm flexible, but I'm just concerned that we're, we're, we're telling ourselves we're going to start shipping product in 30 days, and we have these sorts of issues still re unresolved. Let alone the fact that we don't have Wi-Fi setup working yet. We don't have an update strategy in place. We don't have a lot of stuff. Yeah, so well, I was hoping the last two week summit would be like the last front where we would address those issues and resolve them. But if we keep lumping more problems into that two week summit, I don't think we're going to get there from here. Well, uh, and I think that, um, you know, you've identified a bunch of issues that have already been identified as problem areas. And maybe some of these things are things we can fix before we get to the summit. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, if you've got a working uh, driver for the new SJ201 boards and you're done with that, then maybe this is something that, um, you know, you can start to tackle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that except to say that I will get these pull requests and the other hardware one up and running and tomorrow uh i'll try to figure out uh what the right way to get this all pulled together is uh i'll lean heavy on chris v since chris g will be sleeping and um and we'll talk about it and try to come up with the right solution if not long term at least interim we've had you know a number of discussions about this over the last you know nine months or so and um you know you'll find a wealth of questions and things to be done in the jira ticket system so there's, you know, there's already multiple tickets about resolving skill core and enclosure and closure repo issues. There's already stuff about what is the actual build process for creating images, because right now it's, you know, it's not automated, right? It's semi-automated, um, but there's no, we don't have a continuous delivery system, right? So, um, you know, we want to move in that direction, and uh, you know, so we need to identify all the little. Uh, uh, speed bumps along the way to getting there, right? So, you know, you're right. You're, 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 you're coming into contact with a lot of, you know, sort of the residual messiness of, of the system and uh, stuff that needs to be cleaned up. And, you know, you're also right that it is uh, going to keep us from shipping. So these are things that we need to, to tackle. So Yeah, I mean, it's good the tickets are there. It just seems like they're getting a bit right. All right. Well, let's, let's um uh, start tackling them then okay. um and just to clarify the the qt build system is fully automated so ah, that okay yeah that's good um, to know because all this code runs on kivi yeah yeah but but i also think i think coming back ken to your questions and stuff i think this is the perfect place for micro for, for the team chat and for the dev team chat like you know, asking where things should go, you know, then you don't have to wait until the face to face meeting and, and be blocked. Um, you know, and it gives people can just point the link to exactly where it should go. So, you know, I just encourage people to, to be using the chat more as well between meetings. Yeah, I mean, I think it's deeper than this. Obviously, I think it has to do with uh, our tagging and branching mechanisms and how to know what's the latest version of code on any particular repository that's been deployed? And where is that information retained short of somebody's brain? But um, really, if we're serious about shipping product in 30 or 60 days or whatever it is, the informalities have to come to an end. All right, well, that, that's my update. <laughs> Thank you for that update, Ken. Um, I, after all of that, I'm not sure, really sure where that leaves us. Do we have 
a, an image that, okay, let me put it this way. Um, <clears throat> you have a working uh, Mark II based on the latest Rev3 of the 201 board, right? I do, and I could even send everybody a monkey patch file that would, okay. you would take the existing Kimmy image, run a script that, you know, unzipped from a file I give you, and it will magically apply the changes and everything will work. And I don't have a problem with that being a solution for something going out at the end of the week or whatever, mm -hmm. but it really is seeming like the informalities, like, well, we've always done it this way and we know it's not right. That's got to stop. <laughs> that's where I'm coming from, you know? I've been saying that for a long, long time, Ken. Uh, <clears throat> okay, well. Oh, there's uh, only seven of us. <laughs> Let's, let's, I, I think you should get that monkey patch out so that uh, Josh and Gez and Chris can uh, apply it once they get their hardware devices in. And they'll at least have something to work on. Um, and, All right. Um, I will. I'll get that out first thing in the morning, everybody. Um, instead of a patch script, uh, we can hopefully you know, wipe your personal details off that image and then create an image from it. Might be easier. Um, except all of my images are seriously used and carry a ton of artifacts, right? Like log files and or crap. I mean, I have changes all over the place for logging and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah. Uh, now this will be a simple file that will uh, be a zip file. You unzip it. It'll you run a script. It'll say this file goes into this subdirectory. These files go over here. This file goes over there. It'll display reboot your system now and everything will magically work. And then, you know, we, but again, at some point in time, we need to figure out what really is the right way to solve this moving forward regarding how are we tracking what branches from which repositories are going into what build. Yeah. And, and, you know, and further, we have to, you know, ensure that the right, you're getting the right version for your piece of hardware, right? So you don't need to be downloading this patch if you're running it on Pycroft because it's not going to work for you. It's not going to do anything for you um, in, in the Mark One or a Linux version or whatever, right? So we need to, you know, we need to address all of that. Okay, so um, who hasn't had a chance to talk yet? Uh, Chris Vare? We went hard on over the Geiger stuff. So. You know, did you do that in this meeting or before the meeting? That's not fair. Why does Chris get to go twice? <laughs> yeah, I, of course. I think we're only missing Derek's update. Now. Okay. All right. So things changed a little bit for me based on some earlier conversations that we had. Um, so I had to kind of allocate a lot of time, and I think I should still do so to build devices um, for Project Rollover, but they may not not go directly to project rollover right away um which i think is i think i think that decision is a good one um in a lot of ways the points that ken made can also be applied to some of our hardware stuff um you know we need to test the complete system and uh, you know kevin's been doing a lot of testing on the boards themselves but it's a lot more than that you know we've got to do the engineering validation of the whole system you know and that includes not only the software stuff, but also, um, you know, thermal testing and uh, all, all these other things too. Um, and I'd like us to eventually have um, some audio, automatic audio feedback testing, all this stuff that's obviously didn't have to happen right away, but um, <clears throat> all those things, you know, they don't preclude us from shipping these dev units uh, to backers as long as we have these, you know, a big, a big uh, stamp on there that says this is a developer unit. You know, you're you're getting into it. Um, we don't have all this stuff figured out yet. Um, but yeah, I you know I agree with Kim. There's a lot of a lot of testing, a lot of validation we still have to do before we feel comfortable shipping something. And uh, just to alleviate your concern a little bit, Ken, everything that we've shipped out, I have tested. And I will say that um, I was not seeing those bugs with the audio issue uh, for the rollover units, like we saw after they'd shipped. But had I seen them before, I think I probably would have pumped the brakes a bit. Um, but I, I think I just got a lucky streak or something where I, I just wasn't seeing it like that. 
Um, I think, I think I, part of it might have to do with the packaging. So the unit that I have that Kevin sent me that was the one that really worked as advertised, I'm just not getting any sound out of it. And it, I think it has to do with loose connections and I've reseeded stuff. So it wouldn't surprise me that things came loose during shipment that with them molesting them and moving them around, that uh, connections became loose or whatever. So I, I think some of it has to do with tight packaging versus very loose packaging like we have now and shipment. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I test everything and you know, I if I can't get it to work, then I'm not gonna say we can't really ship it. Um, so anyway, uh, so yeah, my main, my main priority is like we talked about, get everybody uh, these SJ201 device, devices, and um, for a couple of a uh, couple of you, that's going to be some enclosures and or modifications to enclosures, so you can put them in in an uh, enclosure. So if you can I need to get you a, a new top, so that the holes are different on the new design. Um, Chris, I need to get you a board. Let's just try and meet up tomorrow. Um, and then I, I've got your address, Gaz. I assume that hasn't changed, <laughs> so. Um, might want to. Um, I'll just touch base with you after this. And make sure that I haven't shipped you anything in quite a while. So, um, Derek, do you have a working unit that you're planning on running with, like today or tomorrow? I do. Yeah, I have a working unit. So then I'll coordinate with you in the morning and uh, sync up. I'll point you to the Kivi image that I'm using, which should be the latest, and I'll use you as my guinea pig for the monkey patch. Yeah. Cool. Um, so what I haven't done is actually put all this together in the 3D printing enclosure and run it, you know, so if I get the monkey patch, I can do that. And, um, you know, I, would like to spend, spend some time actually getting it to work and, you know, validating it a little bit before I just run it to assembly line mode and build, you know, a bunch of these and then realize, oh wait, they, they have some code version. So, um, yeah, I've got a whole laundry list of things related to Mark II um, hardware stuff to work through, um, as well as a sales deck I need to get an update to Josh for as well. I'll try to actually get that done tonight. Um, but yeah, my main my main goal is to get you guys stuff that works and then get me something closer. You guys are all going to work on the laser cut design to SJ230. I'm, I need to get an SJ240, the 3D print design, working. That's kind of my my highest priority. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Derek. Uh, Ken, so just going back here for a second. Um, Kevin sent you three boards, three SJ201s, right? How many of them work yeah. fully? So um, <laughs> the answer to that question is none. Uh, let's see. I have. I technically have one, two three, four SJ-201s. Um, the, the one, the latest one, the 17 board, the only one that's two spec, by the way, right? The Rev B spec, which is that you can use VF control versus GPIO, right? That the only one I have of that is working except the sound's not coming out, but I already know the volume control is working. <laughs> I already know it's working on the input because I can see the log files it recognizes when I speak. So that's just an issue with connectors. Like I said, he's got these uh, header connectors instead of the actual micro uh, USB connectors. And that's part of where the problem's emanating from. I think also the problem is pushing these buttons um, on the bare board like this stresses the planer a lot more than if you actually had real little feedback switches on them that would say that's enough. You know what I mean? So part of it's probably that. But the answer to your question is of the four boards I have, none of them are working 100%. I've got three of these guys, but they're all the old school uh, GPIO, which is of no value to us anymore because, um, you know, I mean, while that branch is out there, it's never been committed or anything and that code's not there. Uh, so we don't have any code that would support it anyway. Uh, so that being said, um, a half. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll send you a link that's got the uh, status. Uh, Derek uh, 
I think, I think, I don't know, Derek or Kevin created a spreadsheet to keep track of who's got which board and what the status of every board is. So we okay. have to start coordinating through that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I, I'd like to talk with you for just a minute after this meeting. Um, we need to we need to sync up with Kevin on the whole GPIO versus USB issue. Um, okay, that's that's fine as long as it's not talking about the equalizer ticket you assigned to me. Which oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's for the future. That wasn't for for now. So. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right. Hopefully, the future after I've died. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll stay on after this meeting, and we can talk about that. Okay. Uh, Josh, do you have any updates? Panticore thing seems to be working okay. Um, I really need the deck because we have a major distributor that we are sending that off to that wants to potentially wants to work with us, and. Uh, I'm looking forward to the sprint and actually pushing some of this stuff through production. I think that, that Ken kind of nails it on the head. Wait, there's a lack of bandwidth and Gez too. There's a lack of bandwidth between us. Like it's just, we're not in the same office. We're not in the same space. It's difficult to coordinate when you're not. Um, and then finally, like we will get all this stuff squared away. So we'll get there one day at a time. Agreed. Um... Okay, so I'll take a, a look at all the notes from today and um, and and think about um, what are our priorities and what we need to get done before the the summit uh, sprint, and um, I'll get back to all of you on that. Um, so uh, okay, so in the meantime, uh, let's uh, remember to uh, test the new wake word tagger and get Chris some feedback, and we're gonna uh, he's gonna focus on getting getting that into production. And um, we'll talk again on Wednesday. Show me his well, leave. Just a minute, I think you can use him. He's gonna he's gonna work on getting upload wake word into production working, not necessarily the tagger yet. Well, all of it. Okay. Right. So I'll just leave this current sprint open for now. Uh, as it is. Yeah, we'll we'll leave okay. it open. Um, yeah. We okay. can revisit it on Wednesday as to whether we're going to close it out at the end of this week or or not. But right. um, let's just focus on getting the, the things done that need to be done. Um, we'll worry about the, uh, the the sprint, you know, nomenclature and all that later. Um, yep. All right. Uh, OK, thanks, everybody. Um, we'll talk again. In a couple days, if not tomorrow, I'll probably be talking to Ben. And Michael, tomorrow. you and I will talk again now. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right.